This is the Roots and All podcast, and I'm your host, Sarah Wilson. Join me as I talk about all aspects of gardening with some of the top horticulturists from around the world. Hello, and welcome to Roots and All. This week's guest is Hawaii-based writer and grower, Shanae de Abro. When the pandemic began, Shanae became an instant 24-7 caregiver for her Hanai mother. To keep things positive, she started growing food and discovered it also grew peace and calm to their lives amid the ongoing chaos. Shanae had an intuition to write sassy food, to share the inspiration that everyone can grow food at any time of year, anywhere in the world, on any budget. We talk about growing in small spaces, how growing food can foster positive connections in difficult times, and what happens when the creative spark catches. We were in the pandemic. By this time, there was a low going on. Everything was more of a routine. Nobody knew when we were going to get out of the whole pandemic thing and when are we going to get vaccinated and all of those things. And I was a caregiver for my 94-year-old mother, well, Hanai mother. It's like a adoption thing where different people from different generations adopt each other. And it's very common in Hawaii to do this. And so it was just us two in the house and there was no other stimulation. So to help have a positive something to do, I started growing food and she helped me make newspaper pots and plant seeds and all of those kinds of things. So it worked and she had something to look forward to instead of watching hours and hours of the news of this horrific things going on in all countries in the whole world. And she can't leave the house. And after a few months, she would brag to her friends, well, you can be bored, but I'm busy. I'm a sassy farmer and I have a sassy farm. And so that just sort of grew. And then once everything started to get to be a routine and we had a low, I had this spark and it was like, write about it. And I'm like, really? With all the other things that I have to do, I was doing all the cooking, all the cleaning, all the caregiving and write a book. And it's like, yes, write a book. And so I did it. I just followed my intuition and it was just so clear and direct. And I had to do some research, of course, you know, beyond what I was doing, but it really provides a general guide for anyone to grow food. And that is what I wanted because I got so much peace and enjoyment and calm in this completely chaotic environment that I was in. And so did my mother. And I wanted to pass that on to other people because everybody was feeling the same. Yeah, they were. So why sassy farming? What does it mean to you? And what's your background? You know, if you've always been involved in growing food? Well, I haven't always been involved in growing food. I just did it from time to time as a hobby. And essentially, I just stick a few things in the ground and see if it would work or not. <laughs> but the idea of sassy farming and sassy food is because despite not really knowing what we were doing, we were doing it. And so the idea is to get people out of the concept of, well, if I want to grow food, I have to have a big plot of land and lots of know-how and lots of tools. And it's like, no, you don't. You can just grow some sprouts and microgreens and that's enough. And you can have an edible jungle, as I like to call it, because, you know, it just makes it fun. And so you can have a farm and you can have a studio with no windows. Just inside your home, you can do hydroponics, you can do aquaponics, there's grow tents with lights. You can grow everything you need in a two by two square foot area. I got the feeling from reading the book that you feel it's really important that we all grow food. Maybe you could just kind of explore that a bit. Why is it so important, do you believe? Well, I think it's good for a variety of reasons, not just do you get the peace and calm from it. It's also about the energy that you put into it, you get that energy back. And you develop a connection with nature without having to leave your home. And some people that live in congested apartments, big cities, they don't get to experience that tranquility that other people have when they live in the countryside. And this is a way of getting that. And then also there's the food costs. 
we still had to buy food, but we could eat from our farm every day. There was always something to add. And it, it really made us happy. It was just like, look, we have five tomatoes and three beans and some okra. Yay. And we're going to eat from that. And then I would make a microgreen salad if I didn't have lettuce. And that was terrific. And it tastes good because it's literally it's right there. And you can't get fresher produce. Yeah, I like the idea that you explore about growing indoors if you don't have a lot of space. And as you mentioned, one of the things that you talk about is a lot of seeds that you can actually eat as sprouts. So I wondered if you could maybe just briefly talk about how you do that. And I was really interested to know that some need to have light excluded for a while. And I wondered what the reason was behind that as well. Yeah, sure. Well, some seeds need the light excluded because it mimics their time in the soil before they come out of the soil. And other ones, it doesn't matter. They'll still grow if you sit on top of the soil. So what I like to do is there are these little trays and they're double layered and there's holes on the top layer with a cotton wick. And on the bottom layer, you put the water. So I like to use coconut qua, but you can use soil you can just use hot water. Some trays are specifically for water, but this one, I like to use coconut quap because it's a sanitary thing. And so if some of that gets in my food, I don't even worry about it. So what you do is you wet it, you pack it down, wet it, you put your seeds on top, wet that again, and you just do that every day until they start to come out. And wetting it, I mean, you just do a little spray bottle just to wet the seeds on top. But once they start to emerge and you see some growth, then you can put some water in the reservoir. And then that helps you to not forget to water them for them not to dry out. And the seeds will soak up what they need. And then for sprouts, you grow it in jars. And so you have these little sprout lids and you just rinse them twice a day. And in three to five days, you have food. <laughs> And it's concentrated nutrition and it's easy to grow. You don't need grow lights for sprouts. You just set it on any counter and they'll grow. And for microgreens, you may need to put it closer to a window or somewhere where there's some light, but it doesn't need a lot of light and it's easy to grow. The chances of it molding is rare. You just have to rinse and you just have to watch. You may see something that looks like mold, but more than likely, it's just the root hair. And if you spritz it with water, you'll see the difference. Yeah, I liked that idea, not only because it's space saving and it's easy to do, but also because, as you say, it's nutritious, but it seems to open up a whole new world of flavors and things that you just couldn't buy in the shops. But also you did mention the grow tents. And again, I'm guessing they're for people who need to maximize their space growing indoors. Can you tell us about those? Yeah, so there's grow tents and it's essentially just a, a little portable tent that has lights inside and the temperature is more regulated. So you can grow whatever you want in it. They have fans, they have all kinds of stuff, but there's also hydroponic units that come with grow lights that's in a vertical. I have one outside, but I want to bring it inside and put the grow lights on it. And it's a two by two area. I also have vertical units outside with soil. So that idea of vertical farming is important for people that don't have a lot of space. And if you want indoors, hydroponics or the grow tent is really the way to go. You're based in Hawaii and you do grow outside as well. I thought it'd be really interesting if you could just maybe briefly describe your climate and also the kind of things that you're able to grow. Sure. Well, our climate is pretty temperate. On an average, we're between, in Celsius, about 22 to 27 Celsius, but we can get as hot as 33 and as cold as 14. But our homes are single wall and not insulated. We don't have heaters, but we can grow a variety of things, mostly tropical. So what I like to grow is I try to pick things that is grown in Asia because our soil doesn't freeze. And so like English cucumbers and yellow neck squash, things like that, 
doesn't work here because the bacteria needs to die during a freeze so that those produce can grow. I don't know why, but that's just the way it is. So it's really hard for me to grow broccoli and things like that, even though I've tried. But other people seem to have more success, but not much. It's just not our climate. And so I like to grow like Japanese cucumbers and Japanese squash and things of that nature. I grow okra, corn, sweet potatoes, a whole variety of things that grow in hot climates. Also, I think you employ the technique of companion planting quite a bit to keep your plants healthy. I um, thought, again, you could just maybe describe a few of those and tell people what you favour in terms of combinations. Yeah, well, I like marigolds because they're pretty and they're an all-around companion pest repeller. They don't take up a lot of nutrients in your soil and a lot of pests don't like them. I also love lavender because lavender is a great all-around plant. Not only does it smell good and it repels a lot of insects and mosquitoes and some animals don't even like to get near it, but it has a nice calming scent and it's a gorgeous flower. So lavender's okay in your climate, is it? Does it cope quite well? Yes, I can grow lavender. And another thing you mentioned in your book, which is I thought was really fascinating, there was loads of stuff in there actually that I found interesting and new, but you talk about easy and cheap or free ways to propagate edible plants. So what sort of ingenious techniques are you employing there? I like to buy organic produce. I opened a squash. Some of the seeds had sprouted. I planted it. <laughs> and so you can get your seeds from your produce, like tomatoes, cucumbers, all those kinds of things. And then you can also cut off ends of sweet potatoes or potatoes and you can grow those. So if I have something that has sat around for too long and they start growing little sprouts, I just cut the ends off and I plant them. And ginger is good for that. You can cut the bottoms off of lettuce and that will grow again. And then the same with beets. You cut the top off and you stick that in water and roots will grow. And another thing that you spoke about in the book, which I found interesting, was about your kind of philosophy of washing your produce. Can you maybe touch on why you feel that's important and what are some easy natural products that you could use to do that? Well, it's important to wash your produce, especially if it comes from your garden, because you don't know what kind of insects have been on them or animals. And so I like to wash my produce with a combination of baking soda and lemon juice. So I just take about a teaspoon or a tablespoon of lemon juice and about a quarter teaspoon of baking soda. And I put that in water and then I soak my whatever it is, greens or the soft stuff. If I'm washing like sweet potatoes, I'll make a paste out of it and I'll scrub it with a vegetable brush. And that just gets any kind of chemicals, any kind of animal, any kind of soil residue. It just makes it really nice and clean. And I like to make sure that what I'm eating is good, clean food. I'm guessing that you have continued to garden as we move out of the pandemic. How is that going for you? And what are your future plans? Are you going to expand your growing operation? What I want to do is I just want to continue growing for me. Now my Hanai mother has passed, so it's just me in the house. And so I'm just going to keep growing the food that I like and I share with my neighbors and I like helping people learn how to grow their own things. So I offer advice and help and I like to give virtual tours of my farm, but right now I'm currently just busy. So my farm, it goes in cycles, so it kind of ebbs and goes. And so right now it needs a little bit more attention, but I still eat from it every day. I'm sorry to hear about your mother. I didn't realize that. Yeah, well, she was 94. It was so peaceful, but thank you. Well, she was a real character in the book. And how lovely yeah. that you kind of got her involved in the project as well and, and captured her through the book. Yeah, and she was the compost Eve model. Yeah, she was, I remember. <laughs> it's a great she's, book. She was such a sassy person. <laughs> it is such a unique book. You celebrated the women in it as well. How did you come upon that? It was just 
an inspiration. And because I was already in the flow of following my inspiration, when the idea came, I didn't fight it. And the idea to put the women I did in just how they're positioned would come like a picture to my mind. And then all I had to do was just kind of backtrack and figure out who was going to do it and how I would be able to take that photograph. And so my mother, she's so sassy. At 93 years old, she was seeing that I was taking pictures of women and I had planned on taking her photo and I discussed it with her, what I wanted to do with her. But I was waiting for someone to help me get her on the ground and pick her up again. <laughs> and so I was waiting for that person to be able to come. And one day she got upset with me and she was like, Jenny, I don't understand. Why are you using all these models? And I'm here with these legs and you're not using me. <laughs> <laughs> Love her. She's fantastic. And it just goes to show that sexy is any age and feeling good about yourself is any age, any shape, any color. And that's why I wanted to celebrate these women. And most of the women had some kind of body issue. And when they would take photos with me, I would take a few and I would show them what I was creating. And they would be so surprised because it doesn't look like how they were and where they were. There's this one woman and she looks like she's in a jungle, but really it was just a patch of ferns in my front yard. And when I showed it to her, she's like, oh, wow. And then she just gets into the flow. And all of these women came out with a better experience. And I did as well. And I hope that it inspires everyone to not be so hung up about what industry standards are. We should just be ourselves and be happy with ourselves. And with that kind of heart energy, if we connect in that way, can you imagine how better our communities would be? You're right. There's various threads that run through the book and obviously the sort of feminine energy and I think the interest in food and also, as you say, community runs through it. The other thing I thought was really interesting was that you brought music into it as well. Why is food like music to you? Well, because it's like a creation. So you can create music out of your food by creating different songs so you can have like a classical number with using classical ingredients like thyme, oregano, and dill. You can have a jazzy New Orleans blues number with cayenne and cumin. You can also have like Indian music with turmeric, ginger, and garam masala. So you can make it however you want. And you can adjust the spices according to your taste. I feel like recipes could be used as a guide, not necessarily if you don't follow exactly step by step, you're going to come up with something horrible. If you just simply substitute some of the dry ingredients, keeping sure that you kind of get equal amounts of what the recipe calls for, and the same with wet ingredients, you can do whatever you want. And that's what I do all the time because I'm gluten and dairy free and I change up these traditional recipes all the time and nobody knows different. It's really clever that you've got these kind of building blocks almost of flavors and you can pull them together in different ways. It was just so novel, such a novel way of looking at food growing all around. Is that what you intended when you started the book or as you said, you just kind of followed the inspiration? Well, I followed the inspiration and the inspiration is to give others inspiration. And so that's what the intent was. And this idea of this flexible cooking was important to me because so many people say, oh, I can't cook. Oh, I can't. I can't. And I'm like, no, you can. And it's not that hard. And just think about how you can travel around the world at your kitchen. If you just use lemon juice and oregano, you go to Greece. And if you use sumac, you're in Turkey and it's fun. So when I like to cook, I like to play the music of that country and I kind of get into that flavor of what I'm creating. And it just makes it a more fun experience because why does life have to be so serious all the time? Even if we're stressed out and, you know, it's the same amount of time to cook a meal. If you add a little music, 
and it gives you a pep. That's very true. I know it's a difficult question and I don't think you could really boil it down to one thing, but if you wanted to inspire people or for people to take one thing away or to try one thing to start them on the journey, what would you say? Well, if they want to start growing food, I would suggest just start with some sprouts. It's cheap and easy to do. All you need is some wide mouth jars, which if you buy a few spaghetti jars, that's a wide mouth jar. And buying the lids only costs a few dollars. So it's not expensive at all. And then you just need some seeds. And then you just experiment with that. And then you grow from there. If you want to go the more traditional route, then the propagation methods that I talk about, it's free. The food that you're already eating, if it's organic, will generate more food. Thanks, Shane, for sharing the story of your food growing journey with your mother. And thank you to you for listening as well. Honestly, speaking to Shane buoyed me up for days. She is a real inspiration. Now, here's Dr. Ian Bedford talking about butterflies, or more specifically and sadly, the lack thereof. For centuries, Britain's butterflies have been synonymous with long, hot, sunny days and a pleasure to watch as they flutter amongst the summer flowers searching for nectar. But besides the enjoyment of seeing butterflies, their vulnerability to changes in the environment has enabled us to use them as indicator species, for gauging the health of the habitats and ecosystems that they occupy. And so the recent revelation that most of Britain's 58 butterfly species are now in serious decline, and that 24 of them are now at risk of being lost forever, is of immense concern, and sends a powerful message that we must act urgently if we are to save and protect these beautiful insects for the future. But in order to help them recover, we first need to know what issues are causing their decline. And while some are blatantly obvious, like the loss of a particular habitat that a butterfly needs to complete its life cycle, others have been less apparent, such as the systemic insecticides that disperse from field crops through the soil and contaminate the surrounding wild plants that butterflies lay their eggs on and drink nectar from. But by identifying where these and other issues are seriously affecting the survival of a butterfly species, it's now proving possible that by recreating their specific habitats in protected locations, conservationists can successfully re-establish certain species and hopefully bring them back from the brink. However, there's still one major issue that's affecting Britain's butterflies, which currently remains beyond our control and is likely to do so for the foreseeable future. And that's the global rise in temperatures and the effect they're having on Britain's climate, producing warmer winters that can disrupt the overwintering and hibernation of butterflies, severe and extended periods of rainfall that prevent butterflies flying and breeding, and long periods of drought that will desiccate their caterpillars' food plants, especially within the open heath and meadow habitats, where at least 10 species of butterfly develop on wild grass. And also, the extreme summer heat waves, that whilst potentially lethal for some of the temperate climate butterflies, are enabling others more accustomed to Mediterranean climates to become increasingly more common. So whilst we wait to assess the full effects of climate change on the future health and diversity of Britain's butterfly species, there's a couple of things that we could all be doing to help within our gardens. Firstly, by taking part in Butterfly Conservation's Big Butterfly Count each year, recording the species that you see and submitting your data online. Then secondly, by ensuring that there's always plenty of pesticide-free, nectar-rich flowers in the garden, so butterflies can feed and re-energize on their journeys between their breeding sites. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website rootsandall.co.uk. 
please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support the podcast. Because if you enjoy the show, please help it continue. I also have a GoFundMe where you can make a one-off donation. Even a one-off donation of £1 helps, and I'll be really grateful for your support. So please go to Patreon or GoFundMe and search for Roots and All Podcast. <laughs>